Uh, I'd probably win the prize for the shortest talk title, um, but hopefully I can embellish that by some uh, detail. So my talk is uh, addressing a, a topic uh, called One Biosecurity. And it may be unfamiliar to you because it's something that's relatively new. And I want to try and elaborate that as to why One Biosecurity might be an important step for how we not only protect New Zealand, but how we look around the world. So the, the following figure uh, shows uh, the trend since um, the early 1800s. In the black line is the number of uh, alien species recorded somewhere in the world for the first time. And you can see that black line progresses uh, up, upwards and onwards, relatively without too many interruptions apart from the Second World War to the present day. And you can see it tracks very much global trade. Uh, and in particular, since the 1950s, the relationship between the number of uh, alien species, alien plants, pests, insects, etc., recorded for the first time anywhere in the world, uh, follows global trade patterns very closely. So what this tells us uh, are two things. One is the problem of introduced uh, species, whether they're pathogens, pests, insects, or mammals, is not new. It's been going on for at least uh, a couple of centuries. The other thing is it's not going away. If anything, it's potentially getting worse. And so uh, a lot of these organisms cause major economic, human health, and uh, environmental problems. And so we need systems in place that can actually mitigate and prevent the impacts of these organisms. And the basic issue here is that the basic uh, approach is to apply biosecurity. Now, what is biosecurity? Uh, some people feel it's, uh, confuse it with the term bioterror, but it's, it's, it's defined uh, not only in New Zealand, but also by the United Nations as a strategic and integrated approach that encompasses the policy and regulatory frameworks for analyzing and managing relevant risks to human, animal, plant, life, and, uh, and health, and associated risks to the environment. So, um, and the case in New Zealand, it's the exclusion, eradication, or effective management of risks posed by pests and diseases to the economy, environment, and human health. So the key thing here, biosecurity is not simply plant biosecurity, the topic that many of us have been working on over the last few years. It's a much broader theme and concept. And it actually is all encompassing. It's a far broader holistic vision of what biosecurity is than what is actually often applied either by scientists or by governments. And so it's this issue that it bridges human, animal, plant, and environmental health that forms the basis of this idea of one biosecurity, that there's one approach that we could adopt to deal with all these threats rather than dealing with them piecemeal. To give you an example, um, the, uh, obviously we've all become much more aware of biosecurity issues under COVID. But historically and, and currently, many of the, the concepts within human health and the, the issues of dealing with a pathogen and uh, issues dealing with a, a, path, a, a parasite or an invasive species have been dealt quite differently. But we can see that there's very many similarities between the two. If we look at a pathogen, a pathogen can often be moved around through a vector, and that process is described by a, a process of transmission. Similarly, an invasive species also has vectors. They just happen to be somewhat larger. Uh, and they, again, move species around the world. And our terminology for those is pathways. But if you get away from the terminology and the taxonomy, you can see emerging structures and features that mean that we could probably deal with the same conceptual issues, uh, whether it's a, a, a human disease or it's a, a, a pest of forestry. But it's not only the, the process, it's the pattern. Here is the, the first SARS, when we thought we'd never hear about SARS again. But this is the, the original SARS in 2003-2004, uh, uh, heading out from Hong Kong around the world in a matter of a few months. You can see this uh, quite rapid spread across most of the continents of the world. Now, we often see this as a pandemic, and we tend to view pandemics as being driven by diseases. But if you look at many of the invasive alien species spreading around the world, their patterns are remarkably similar. So here is the, the red swamp crayfish. It was a species that's uh, highly valued in aquaculture, but uh, it can actually climb out of uh, tanks and, and wander off and become established in rivers. And so as you can see here, while the timescale is uh, somewhat different, the patterns of spread 
show uh, similar kinds of trends, long jumps across continents, so that over a matter of 30 or 40 years, this species has become effectively pandemic. It's everywhere uh, it could possibly establish almost. And uh, a more familiar organism perhaps is the bronze bug, a pest of eucalyptus, which again originated in Australia, uh, more recent spread now and also quite, uh, quite fast. This has followed its host, eucalyptus species, again around the world and is probably found in most areas of the world where eucalyptus is, is grown commercially. So again, these are global issues. They're not just happening in one country. There are pandemic uh, organisms. And we can look at the rates of spread of these organisms, and true, pathogens do spread faster than other organisms. But actually, the differences aren't that marked. Apart from human health, the pathogens of human health seem to spread very quickly. But if we look at plant or animal pathogens compared to vertebrate plants or, or invertebrate pests, the rates of spread cover a similar order of magnitude. So while uh, we might be concerned about COVID uh, and it, the rapid spread around the world, many of the pest species that we're dealing with are progressively spreading wider and wider around the world. And as Jennifer mentioned, I, I didn't plant the question in her to, to, to Stuart, is that you know, it is, these issues are international. They can't be dealt with any one country by themselves. And certainly, no matter how I, the good efforts of biosecurity in New Zealand, you can't deal with this problem in isolation. The other issue is that uh, when we compare with diseases, the whole issue of COVID has, has uh, probably focused people's attention on the border and on biosecurity. And, and Stu, Stu said that uh, in New Zealand, much, nowadays people are much more focused on biosecurity. But it's true for the world. If you look at Google Trends, uh, if you've got a spare afternoon, uh, what you can see is that uh, the term biosecurity, as soon as COVID hit different parts of the world, people started searching for biosecurity. So that terminology now is in people's mindsets. And that means not only the average public, but also hopefully policymakers and decision makers. That what is biosecurity? COVID has brought that to our home. It's about the border. It's about uh, pathways around the world. It's about surveillance. It's about detection and early response. All these terminologies that those of us who've worked in biosecurity before use as a general uh, lexicon has now become almost common, um, common language to us all. But the problem is, we as scientists should be able to respond to this, but we're not doing a really great job. If we look at the science across the different sectors of human health, environmental health, plant health, and animal health, the circles here, and they're logarithmically scaled, so uh, the research that goes on in human health is several orders of magnitude greater than either in environmental health or animal health, um, you can see that there's quite big disparities in the amount of research that's going on in dealing with these different, different topics. And the area that's closest to our hearts, plant health, gets uh, relatively little attention compared to these other fields. But then when you look at the interfaces between those different fields and the kinds of papers that actually publish joint work, looking at the interaction, for example, between environmental and human health, you see other patterns emerging. In that there's uh, much more joined up uh, work going on between human health, environmental health, and animal health than there is with plant health. But even so, environmental health and animal health have relatively weak interactions. So the, system is, the science system is disjointed. We tend to like sitting in our silos, and we don't necessarily look across to different disciplines to try and learn from their best practice. And part of this, and here's an Australian example, is the research we do is fundamentally siloed by our funding agencies. Uh, and here uh, are some Australian uh, CRCs. Um, so there's the CRC in plant biosecurity, weed management, digital health, emerging diseases, invasive animals, tropical plant protection, etc. All these groups working on fundamentally uh, similar processes, but dealing it with working in isolation. And this is a fundamental problem because there are lessons to be learned from all these disciplines that we're missing out on. This wouldn't be as bad, but it reflects actually the regulatory space that we work in as well. If we look at the international regulatory space, again, these are logarithmically scaled circles, the amount of money that goes to support the World Health Organization is vast compared to any of the other organizations. And we'd expect that, I suppose, human health is a real priority. But if any of you can actually see the uh, amount that goes to the International Plant Protection Organization, which is way down here at the bottom of the figure, you can see that the amount of uh, resources going into international regulatory efforts within our broad area is tiny. And if you look at the amount of work that's going on in, in the interfaces of these areas, 
then you can see that much uh, discussion has been occurring between the World Health Organization and the World Organization for Animal Health, but basically very little with the other groups. And particularly, in the International Plant Protection Organization is somewhat left out on a limb. So we're not integrating very well in a regulatory framework. And why do we need this integration? Well, primarily because the future threats we're facing don't distinguish whether you're a human health pathogen or a plant pathogen or an animal pathogen. So we have greater urbanization. Urbanization are hotspots. Urban areas are hotspots for emerging diseases. They're entry points for pests. And the high urban uh, natural interface means that organisms can spread from urban environments outwards. Climate change, we heard quite a bit of that from Anita uh, yesterday. But again, an improved climate for pests, uh, ecosystems become less resilient, and there are extreme events, all of which can accelerate uh, problems of human, animal, plant diseases. And agricultural int intensification means there's pathogen spillover to humans, there's facilitation of pest spread across landscapes, and the fragmentation of naked, native ecosystems makes them more susceptible to invasion. So we do need a joined up. Uh, approach because the pressures are common and we don't have the resources to work at them individually. Now some of you might say, hang on Phil, what about One Health? We've all heard of One Health. This is something that's being promoted quite widely. In fact, there's journals, a journal called One Health. There are books entitled World Health, One Health. And One Health, if you're not familiar with it, is designed to be a collaborative, multi-sectorial and transdisciplinary approach working at local, regional, national and global levels to achieve optimal health and well-being outcomes, recognizing the interconnections between people, animals, plants, and the shared environment. So isn't that what we should be doing? We perhaps, let's forget one biosecurity, let's just do One Health as a, as, a, as a term out there. But when you scratch at the surface of One Health, you see some uh, clear signals. The first of all, it's dominated by the, 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 the twin terrors of doctors and vets, who don't like each other anyway, but um, most of the science that's going in that space is dominated by human health, veterinary sciences, and disease biology. The actual environmental science component to that is tiny. In fact, it's only less than 7% of all the research going on in One Health addresses any interactions with the environment at all. And when you tease apart that uh, element of environment, you can see that in terms of the environmental issues, it's things like zoonoses, antimicrobial resistance, and wildlife reservoirs. The issue of invasive species, biological invasions, and biosecurity just don't feature very strongly in One Health. And what I'd like to do is propose that perhaps this is the wrong way approach. Perhaps we do need something called One Biosecurity that can complement One Health, but can bring the, the researchers in the broad area of biosecurity together in a much more joined up approach. So let's begin with just a schematic to look at uh, the interactions between uh, the environmental health, animal health, and human health. And you can see the, the, the human health is the, the, the couple at the bottom there, and then the animal health is the, the, the cow, and then there's the environmental health, which is a, a wild pig with a tick on it, just to make sure that we cover as many taxonomic groups as possible. Um, but you can see this transmission of, for example, of pathogens, pathogens and parasites from wildlife reservoirs to to uh, uh, livestock, zoonoses from livestock to humans, and of course, pathogens from wildlife reservoirs to humans. And this is the remit of One Health, really. But One Biosecurity is much broader because here we bring in plant health. And plant health links in very closely. So for example, invasive alien pests and plants reduce quantity quality of food, which is a major issue for food security and human health. Uh, mycotoxins in... Um, in, from invasive plant pathogens in seeds cause problems to animal health. And uh, wildlife reservoirs, as well as spreading diseases, can destroy crops and, uh, and, and, and so have impacts that way. Weeds, my favorite topic, also fit in here as well. Uh, pollen allergens are a major issue in, in, in New Zealand, and most of those arise from introduced plants. Uh, invasive plants can uh, cause poisoning in livestock. And invasive alien plants actually can actually act as, as hosts to some of the vectors that carry animal diseases. And of course, weeds can Im impact on plant health, and actually many crops can actually become feral and become weeds themselves, such as kiwifruit. So as you can see, it's a much more holistic perspective of what biosecurity is, much more of a, uh, a rounded approach that requires 
interdisciplinary work amongst all disciplines to deal with these kinds of problems. We can't view them in isolation. And a case in point, there are actually some pests that are cross-sectorial, like they're red imported fire ant. Not only does that impact human health, it impacts livestock health, it reduces native biodiversity, and it damages crops. So again, a cross-disciplinary approach to these problems is required. So why do I think one biosecurity is better than one health? Well, partly because I'm kind of promoting one biosecurity and I'd like everyone to wear the T-shirt soon. <laughs> but um, the other issue, I do actually find that one health is a bit of a, a, a mask. And uh, the more you dig into it, the more you realize it's, it's not what it's set out to deal. So one health currently does not address issues that are major components of biosecurity. It doesn't really deal with the issue of international trade and human travel in, uh, travel in how pests, weeds, and diseases move around. It doesn't actually understand or address the international protocols for sanitary inspections of imports and exports. One Health doesn't uh, actually uh, examine uh, the effectiveness of biosecurity interventions, either at the international borders or at the farm gate. And it doesn't really use uh, risk assessment tools to forecast or predict future, future threats. And it doesn't even examine the triggers of pandemic diseases outside of endemic areas. So, what I'd like to promote is while One Health might be a nice concept, it's not actually designed to be applied as such. It's very much a, a wishful thinking, at least in my eyes. And One Biosecurity broadens that concept to include strategies and policies for mitigating those risks and more in explicitly integrates the different disciplines of human, animal, plant, and environmental health. So just to conclude, um, what we're finding out through COVID is that biosecurity is essential in a world that's exposed to multiple threats of impact of human, animal, plant, and environmental health. Yet still, sector uh, policies is sector specific, and that's a major flaw in terms of any international response to a major biosecurity threat. One biosecurity is potentially can bridge those sectors by bringing um, the different sectors together uh, and provide greater foresight in the management of invasive species and diseases. Uh, many invasive species uh, tackle and impact multiple different sectors, and yet we often look at just one aspect of their impacts when we're trying to study those pests. Uh, and so uh, we need to develop current uh, risk assessment tools that can deal much more broadly with problems than just focused on our own little discipline. And the major future societal challenges, such as urbanization, climate change, agricultural intensification, will have impacts across all kinds of threats, independent of the sector that we're working in. And we're woefully underprepared to deal with those in our individual sectorial silos. So hopefully something like One Biosecurity, which brings the conversation together, and so that in the future, rather than have a meeting of uh, mostly plant bioprotection uh, individuals, would have animal health, plant health, environmental health, and uh, uh, human health together, would probably be the, the, the way forward. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you. <laughs>